Hey everyone, this is Brooks Popwell from Pure Life Ministries. You're about to hear part of our bi-weekly podcast, Purity for Life. Hope you enjoy. In this segment, Nate Dancer talks with several Pure Life Ministries counselors about the problem of hopelessness that those who are struggling with sexual sin often experience. The counselors featured are, in order, Ken Larkin, Residential Program Pastor Ed Book, and Jeremiah Aiken. To hear the rest of this roundtable discussion about helping people who are struggling with habitual sexual sin, check out episode number 328. Well, I want to move on to the hopelessness that people feel when they're trapped in sexual sin. And this is something I know that we talk about a lot to the students in the residential program because we want to communicate to them that we understand the hopelessness that comes from this. Could I get a couple of you to share some personal testimony about coming out of hopelessness? I'd like to start by just saying that hopelessness is not necessarily a bad thing. It could be a tremendous catalyst for change to bring someone to the end of themselves and turn them to the Lord, who is the only one that can really uh, help them uh, and deliver them from this issue of sexual sin. And I found that in my own life— when I finally ran out of my own resources, when I finally became hopeless and realized I wasn't going to change through my own efforts alone, it's when I was willing to, willing to reach out for help, and that ultimately led me coming into the residential program. Yeah, for sure. I feel like in some measure I, I must be an expert on hopelessness, having gone through uh, that period of my life when I was living under such an incredibly dark cloud. Uh, and it was really the guilt of my sin, but I did not make that connection at the time at all. So I just thought that I had, you know, some kind of chemical imbalance or something going on inside me that predisposed me to a a dark outlook. You know, the the pessimist, the glass is always half empty, but it was much, much worse than that. It was to the point where I wanted to kill myself. I attempted twice to do that. But even beyond uh, those suicidal thoughts, all day, every day, I went around with like a chant in the back of my mind, you know, kill me, kill me, just let me die. And it was like, in my mind, I was praying it to the Lord. But in reality, I was probably chanting it to just internally to myself, but wishing I was dead and saying it over and over and over. And it was, you know, something I did laying on my bed at night as I'm trying to fall asleep, I would just chant that over and over, please kill me, let me die, don't make me go through this kind of thing. And it really wasn't, uh, it it became such a natural part of my life that I quit paying uh, any attention to trying to break away from it, trying to get rid of it. Uh, And it wasn't until I came to Pure Life uh, in the residential program back in 2004, and I was uh, here for several weeks. And one morning I just, I woke up and I was sitting on the edge of my bed And I literally became aware that I I said it to myself, I don't do that anymore. I don't chant like that. Those thoughts aren't there anymore. They're gone. And I really believe the Lord brought me into just such a heavily consecrated atmosphere that that demonic voice couldn't coexist any longer. And I was delivered from it. Uh, And that was my experience. But I've certainly been through a lot of hopelessness. All right. Before we go on, just really quickly, you— All three of you obviously mentioned the residential program and the change that you experienced while you were going through that program. Could one of you maybe just explain that a little bit more? What what is the value of it from your perspective? What is it that is offered in the residential program that wouldn't be offered to people who are just in the outside world trying to uh, find freedom from sexual sin? The reason why we talk, like you'll hear us refer to, you know, when I was at the residential program, when I came to the residential program, this happened. This was, I mean, I don't want to speak for all of us, but I think it's true. Men had laid down their life and knew Jesus in such a real way. They were giving us the truth and it was changing our life. Like they were imparting the truth of the Bible to us in a way that was real. They were living it out. And you don't have to – that can happen (laughs) anywhere, but it doesn't. And this 
Pure Life is a place where it's centered around men laying down their lives for Jesus, and that's why people get free. And so that's why we refer to it. It was where we came into the truth of the gospel. Um, but it can men can choose to do that. You know, you don't have to be at Pure Life to choose to walk out the gospel. Okay, great. Let's get back to the hope, the question of hopelessness, and I want to get a little bit more specific. What are some things that you would say to a hopeless counselee? What are some of the specific points of counsel that you would give to them? And then what are some of the things that you would avoid saying to a person who is hopeless? Well, one obvious thing when someone's dealing with hopelessness is uh, to get them to understand that the reason why they're hopeless is they're focusing upon themselves. And we really, uh, as spiritual leaders, need to get people to focus upon the Lord, get them into the Word of God for themselves, get them uh, into the promises of God, and focus on the cross and what God has done for them and the power of God to change their life. There's tremendous hope in Jesus Christ, and there's no hope in their flesh of changing. One thing to avoid saying is everything's going to be all right. You know, you'll make it through this, or, you know, things are going to get better. You don't know that. Lots of times when you are dealing with these issues, things get worse. And those aren't true statements to say everything's just going to be all right. Um, You have to equip someone to face reality, not just give them words that will make them feel better because once they get back to reality, those words will just fall away. And so just as uh, Ken said, um, we have to give them the truth. Yeah, hand in hand with what these guys are saying, I would just say I think one of the most helpful things you can do for someone is identify their problem as sin because the the world system has kind of given them lots of other descriptions for it and we don't often use biblical terminology. For example, we don't talk about adultery. We talk about affairs and you know, mistresses and, and different terms for it. But if we stick to the biblical words and we call it sin, the Bible has an answer for sin. And that's what we're really wanting to help people see, that there is tremendous hope. Oh, I have a sin problem, and Jesus is my answer. The blood of Jesus is my answer. The Holy Spirit gives me power to overcome sin. And that's where their hope is going to come from. You know, as we're talking, this is bringing two types of people up in my mind. First, there's the guy who is so hopeless that he comes to the conclusion, I cannot change. I will never be able to stop doing what I'm doing. And then there's the person that is trapped in habitual sexual sin, but for whatever reason, they're just not that desperate yet. How would you deal with each of those two extremes? Well, with regard to the person who says, I can't stop, which is probably more commonly the guy who's coming to the attention of his pastor is the guy who's got this problem, uh, but he feels like he's just enslaved to it, and he truly is, but he's saying over and over in his head even, I can't stop, I can't do anything about this. But the truth is he can. What we constantly find is that it's a motivation problem really, at the heart of it. Uh, for example, I've even uh, dealt with counselees at times, and I've, I've thrown this out to them. You know, I, they'll tell me, I can't stop uh, self-gratification. I'm, I can't help it. And I'll say, well, what if I would pay you a million dollars to go 30 days without self-gratifying? Could you do that? Oh, yeah, then I could do it. Well, okay, so we have a motivation problem, not a ability problem. And that's really uh, what you're almost invariably coming up against and trying to get them to see the uh, riches of heaven and the life in God as worth it is a uh, key to overcoming that attitude of I can't help it. And with that also, I would say uh, to say I can't stop – uh, is definitely not true uh, from a bi- biblical standpoint. If uh, if Jesus Christ can't deliver someone from sin, we're all in trouble, and he came to save us from our sins. And Paul did say in second, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you as as such as is common to man. And it's it's a natural for you to, to, to be tempted. But he also goes on to say, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So the Holy Spirit 
is at work in the believer's life. They have the promises of God. They have other believers and different things to fall upon for support. But the bottom line is there is power and there is deliverance from sin. And if they don't find they have that, either they're not availing themselves of what God has provided, or maybe they have to realize they don't know the Lord, and they don't have the Holy Spirit, and they don't have the spiritual wherewithal to overcome their temptation, because they don't really have, they're not born again. Someone may come to you and have a legitimate issue with sexual sin, that they're given over habitually to sexual sin, but may not see that it's a real big issue, so they're not really either willing to change or they're not hopeless or don't see it as a big deal. And definitely, as a pastor, uh, it would be important to point out the seriousness of their sin. It's interesting, in many different uh, places in Scripture, especially in Paul's epistles, he points out, he, he lists categories of sin, and in three specific passages, one in Ephesians, one in Galatians, and one in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul lists sins, and he says, he starts out with sexual sin in the forefront, and he basically says, don't be deceived, or he says something to the effect of, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it is a really big deal from God's standpoint. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, but those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity, and if they're living in habitual sin and calling themselves a Christian, it's a lot bigger issue than they probably think it is. And as I'm listening to to Ken say that, uh, you know, I'm just thinking of the letters in the Book of Revelation, the seven letters to the churches, and at least three of them mention sexual immorality in some form. And the call to all those churches is to repent. And so even uh, if you look at those letters as kind of a a window into end times events, uh, sexual sin is going to be rampant. And God has a large problem with it, so to speak. He is uh, adamant uh, that it needs to be addressed and uh, and it needs to be addressed with repentance. Thanks for listening. You can find Purity for Life on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Or just go to our website, purelifeministries.org slash podcast. Podcast.